Hello and welcome to a Motion episode of Apple A Day. Today I'm going to show you a ready-to-use Apple Motion template that creates a grid-based photo slideshow. I originally was going to do a tutorial on building this from scratch, but that was becoming way too lengthy and would certainly have been a tedious uh, process for you guys. So instead of walking you through the step-by-step -step build, I'll explain how it works and show you how you can use it right away in Final Cut Pro. A link for the template is available in the description below, so go ahead and download that now. And if you don't mind, please like and subscribe. Okay, so I'm assuming you have that downloaded, so let's get started. As you can see, I have the downloaded folder on my desktop called Grid Slideshow. Inside the folder is the motion project and a couple of thumbnails and a media folder. And inside the media folder are 37 images, one for each drop zone. I'll open the project so we can see how it works. So in the viewer, you can see this grid containing 36 drop zones. There's a 37th drop zone behind all of these, which gets revealed at the very end. In the Layers panel, there's a camera and a folder containing those 37 drop zones. I'll press play so you can see what it does. The drop zones fly towards the camera and linger for a moment before flying off and leaving a hole. The background is out of focus, and when the drop zone flies in to fill the screen, it comes into focus. Also, all of the drop zones in the background are wiggling back and forth. As you get to the end, when the last drop zone is fully revealed, it comes into focus and brightens up so it can be seen. So what is actually happening here behind the scenes? First, let's take a look at the camera. I'll go back to the beginning of the timeline and select the camera and go over to the inspector. These properties are red because they have keyframes which change their values over time. If I click on the right arrow, it will take me to the next keyframe. It looks like they all change at the end for the last drop zone. These values change to allow that last drop zone to come into focus by reducing the depth of field blur amount and increasing the far plane. The far fade is also reduced, which has the effect of fading in the last drop zone without moving it. So going back to the beginning, the first drop zone to move into view is drop zone 8. So a few things are happening. We have this framing behavior, which is responsible for moving the drop zone to fill the camera frame. I'll select the behavior so we can take a closer look. In the inspector, under the behavior tab, we can see that the target is the camera. So that means that during the duration of the behavior, the drop zone will move into the camera area. The transition is set to ease both, which gives us a smooth start and end to the movement. One value that is important is this path offset in the Z axis. It's set to 3000. I'll change it back to zero and press play. You can see how the slide moves directly in a straight line towards the camera. It works, but it lacks a little finesse. So by adding a value to the path offset, it forces movement by 3000 pixels in the direction of the Z axis. So entering 3000 to that value forces the drop zone to move straight out before filling the view in the center of the screen. It creates a curved, fancier move, which I think is visually appealing. So that's all that's happening to get the drop zone to fill the frame. To get the drop zone completely off the screen, that's done with keyframes on the z-axis of the position property. The first keyframe is the starting point at the very end of the frame behavior. The second keyframe is exactly three seconds later, and this moves the drop zone towards the camera just a little bit. See how the value is slightly larger? This makes for a slow zoom over three seconds. And then the last keyframe is 15 frames later, a half a second. And this has a dramatic increase in the Z value, resulting in the slide flying off the screen. It also fades out at the same time, and that's due to the camera settings. I didn't have to add a fade to the drop zone. I'll quickly go back to the camera, and the value I have set for near fade is what's causing the fade when the layer moves beyond this range. And just a reminder that the camera is not moving. The individual drop zones are moving. Back to drop zone eight. Okay, so after that last keyframe, that's it. And the rest of the drop zones work exactly the same way with one addition. The rest of the drop zones also have another behavior added to them. Drop zone 17 is the next one right after drop zone eight. I just chose the order at random. I'll select that and you can see it has a framing behavior timed to start at the end of the last keyframe from drop zone eight. So as soon as drop zone eight is finished flying off the screen, 
The next slide, drop zone 17 in this example, will start to move towards the camera. This process is repeated exactly the same for each drop zone. The only addition is the wriggle behavior, which does exactly what it says. It makes the drop zone wriggle back and forth. I added this behavior because the background just seemed a bit too static. The drop zones wriggle, and when that behavior ends, it is immediately followed by the framing behavior, which moves the drop zone to fill the screen. And then, of course, the keyframes are added to move it completely off the screen. Note that to have each drop zone wriggle differently, I changed the random seed for each wriggle simply by clicking on this refresh button. And that's pretty much it. The tedious part was laying out all of these drop zones in this grid pattern and, of course, adding the behaviors and keyframes for each slide. But it's all done and ready for you to add this to your template library and use it in Final Cut Pro. All you had to do was publish each drop zone so they're available in Final Cut Pro. If you go into Project Properties and over to the Project tab, you can see all of the published drop zones. I'll close the project. And on my desktop, you can see that I have the Project folder on the right. And on the left, I have the Motion Templates folder. This can be found in your Movie folder, which is inside your User folder. I'll right-click on the folder name and you can see the hierarchy of where it's stored. So within this Motion Templates folder, there's a folder called Generators. I'll open that up. And here you can create a new folder called Apple a Day, or call it whatever you like. I already have one called Apple a Day, so I'll open that up. So I'm going to move the Grid Slideshow folder into this Apple a Day folder. And that's it. That's all you have to do. This should now be available for use within Final Cut Pro. So next, I'll open up Final Cut Pro, and I've already got a project ready, and I've already got 37 sample images, which I created using Leonardo. I also included a link to these sample images in the description below, so if you want to follow along, go ahead and download those now. Once you have them downloaded, you can just select them all and drag them into your project window. So let's add the new grid template to the timeline. At the top left, I'll click on the Titles and Generators button, and in Generators, I'll go to Apple a Day, and in there is the Grid Slideshow that I just added. I'll drag that down to the timeline, and then I'll go back to Libraries. I'll press Play, and you can see it works just as it does in Motion. I'll speed it up a little bit. So all that's left is to add images, and we can use those 37 sample images that I provided. So I'll put the playhead back to the beginning, and with the Grid Slideshow selected in the timeline, you can see all of the drop zones over on the right, numbered 1 through 37. Over on the left, I'm going to scroll down to image 1 and drag that into the image well for drop zone 1. And then, of course, do the same for the remaining 36 drop zones. I'll fast forward through this process because it does take some time. Whew! Okay, that's done. Now, for each drop zone, I've also published the pan and zoom controls so you can adjust the images individually if needed. So let's test it out. I'll position the playhead so Drop Zone 8, the first one, is filling the screen. In the inspector on the right, I can see under Drop Zone 8 that I have a Pan 8 and Scale 8. Panning lets you move the image horizontally and vertically, and scaling, of course, makes it larger or smaller. So I'm going to scale this image up so it's a tighter shot on the dogs, and use the pan controls to move the image around. That looks pretty good there. So I guess all this needs is some music, and it's done! I'll leave the music choice up to you guys. Well, that's it for today. Now, I know I didn't cover creating this template from scratch. That really wasn't the point. I've already got other tutorials that show you how to do that, and I'll put links in the description below. I hope you enjoyed this motion video, and I hope you get some use out of the free slideshow provided. I'll try to do more of these in the future. Don't forget to like and subscribe. My name's John Martins, and I'll see you in the next episode of Apple A Day. <music>